Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We now are in Song of the Broad X, passage number three. Now, the uh, passage number three is one of the longer catalog sections. Certainly, this is the longest section in Broad Axe. Um, some hate these catalogs. Others uh, find these catalogs much like they love to read those sections from Moby Dick on Whaley, and they and they enjoy they enjoy the the different and multiple perspectives. Um, how about this? Sixty one lines of this section begin with the word "the," and we've seen this before. Now the assumption is that you've been reading along with us at LearnStrong.net. You've got your own copy, I hope, of the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. And you've been working with us, Talks with Walt is the name of the playlist down that left-hand side at LearnStrong.net. And um, my hope is that you've been with us from the very beginning in the inscriptions, uh, texts, all the way up through and including Song of the Broad Acts, section number two. Now, as for background information here, just for a few moments to kind of set you up, we're going to look at all the different uses of the acts in this section. We're going to talk about what some scholars have called hit a Whitman's view of mystic evolution. That is to say, like the yin-yang symbol, and we talked about this when we did our William Blake, Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience, there is both positive and negative to the axis we've already spoken about. Yes, it is a weapon, but it is also a tool, as we've said. He also wants to show what he calls, quote, the beauty of all adventurous and daring persons, end quote. So we're going to get a celebration. And again, we've seen this so many times. Pioneers, oh, pioneers will be an actual poem that we will read later. We'll have some sense of it here. And, and of course, the axe in some ways is the beginning of all action. What we might call, as we've talked about it elsewhere, the logos, that origination idea. The axe becomes a really powerful symbol in some ways of that. Now, our, our, our only Norton's reference for this one is to be reminded that in lines 45 to 72, we're going to hear something about building, and we're going to remember that the poet's youthful experience as a carpenter comes to mind. His love of the trustworthy tools, the well-joined wood, the familiar excitement of the fire in that fire-prone age will also be spoken about as well. Now, because this is a longer section, I'm not going to get to do what I like to do, where I would read the entire thing and then we would exegete. Let's just go through it, and again, right away, this cataloging, um, we saw it in Song of Myself, Passage 33, a long selection there. We saw it as well in Salute of Mont, so you've, you're, you're familiar with this. The log at the woodpile, the axe supported by it. By the way, notice the beautiful balance of that first line of this section. The sylvan hut, the vine over the doorway, we'll think obviously in the hut of, of Ten Turn Abbey, Wordsworth's Ten Turn Abbey, as well as, of course, this vine over the doorway will make us think about lilacs last in the dooryard bloom, a, a really important poem in Leaves of Grass that we'll get to. The space cleared for a garden, the irregular tapping of rain down on the leaves after the storm is lulled, so you're just getting images, obviously, leaves as in leaves of grass. The walling and moaning at intervals, the thought of the sea, this idea that there's always the motion of the sea that one is considering. The thought of ships struck in the storm and put on their beam ends, and the cutting away of masks, obviously the first reference uh, to a possible axe. The sentiment of the huge timbers of old-fashioned houses and barns. Now, already for Whitman and for his readers, there are uh, houses that one might call old-fashioned, which is kind of interesting for us to think about. If they were old for Whitman, what would they be for us, right? The remembered print or narrative, here, here we have to think about Moby Dick, remember, published in 1851. The remembered print or narrative, the voyage at a venture of men, families, goods, the disembarkation, the founding of a new city. Now, I have said to you a number of times that I believe that one of the things, among other things, that Whitman is doing in Leaves of Grass is that he is going back to, to somehow collect, can I use that verb, collect, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid as those texts that he's going to bring forward in his set of poems. Uh, thinking about the Odyssey as the voyage and thinking about the founding of a new city and the opening lines of the Aeneid. We've given full lectures on all those titles at LearnStrong.net. The voyage, he's back to it again, of those who sought a New England and found it, the outset everywhere, and we're going to begin to celebrate, obviously, the whole notion of pioneering spirit. The settlements of the Arkansas, Colorado, Ottawa, the Canadian River, uh, the Wilmette, uh, uh, Western Oregon River. We've commented already on his love of rivers. The slow progress, that's an important phrase. The scant fare, the axe, and there finally it is. 
uh, rifle, saddlebags, and others. These are all the accoutrements of, of pioneers. The beauty of all adventurous and daring persons, this some have argued is the key line of all of uh, Song of the Broad Axe. The fact that he uses the word beauty takes us back, obviously, to Aristotle and the Aristotelian idea of aesthetic theory and poetics, as we've talked about elsewhere. Daring persons, you'll remember, ten turn abbey, and so I dare to hope, though change no doubt from what I was when first I came among these hills, blah, blah, blah. Also, the word daring, think about what happens in Song of Myself, passage 46. I will you to be a bold swimmer, right? Laughingly dash with the hair. The challenge of Leaves of Grass is always to try to dare to be something greater. He comes back to the word beauty again of wood boys and wood men with their clear, uh, clear untrimmed faces. I told you he loves this thing about beards. It takes us back to the whole notion of hair from our study of Milton's Paradise Lost. Three times now with beauty. The beauty of independence, departure, actions that rely on themselves. We cannot read a line like that without thinking about, first of all, Emerson's self-reliance and obviously Thoreau's especially part two, book two of Walden, and we commented elsewhere at LearnStrong.net on all of those Emerson and Thoreau lines. The American, and I told you guys, when he uses the word American, he, loses, he doesn't do it very often. America's greatest poet doesn't use the word America very often, and so here it's going to be significant. The American contempt for statutes and ceremonies, the boundless impatience of restraint, we have said, if you want to define the American spirit, obviously Promethean, it's don't tell me what to do, the Declaration of Independence, and so here this is. The loose drift of character, again, we're coming back to the both polar um, sides, the positive, the negative, the loose drift of character, obviously many said this of, uh, of Whitman in his day, the inkling through random types, the solidification is obviously Whitman maybe referencing to some degree himself or what's been said about himself. And now all of a sudden we're just going to get to a whole bunch of different kinds of people and situations where an axe might be used. The butcher in the slaughterhouse, the hands aboard schooners and sloops, the raftsmen, the pioneers, again, pioneers will pioneers will actually be a poem that we'll study later. Lumbermen in their winter camp, daybreak in the woods, obviously we think of Thoreau, stripes of snow on the limbs of trees, the occasional snapping. It's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, image, and obviously it takes us back to our reading of Walden, especially when Thoreau loves to talk about trees as well. The glad, clear sound of one's own voice. We've heard this a number of times in Song of Joys, or I Hear America Singing. The merry song, the natural life of the woods. Thoreau considered himself a naturalist. I think Whitman would have felt comfortable with the same phrase. The strong days were. It is significant that Whitman is constantly celebrating the fact that Americans are people who love to work. Don't just work, they love it. They are defined by it. And, you know, there is a good argument to be made that when America no longer enjoys working, something fundamentally has been lost in America. And clearly reading Whitman's Leaves of Grass will remind us there is something beautiful, can we use that since he used it, something beautiful about the ability to work and work that's worthy of engagement as, uh, you know, FDR, or, I'm sorry, Teddy Roosevelt once said, nothing greater than doing work worth doing, right? Uh, the blazing fire at night, now all of a sudden we're going to get to some, some images that clearly Whitman saw. Uh, the sweet taste of supper, the talk, the bed of hemlock boughs, and the bare skin. Uh, this, of course, uh, will take us to now all of the references to building. Whitman was a builder. He loved to build, so we'll enjoy this one now. Uh, the house builder at work in cities or anywhere, the preparatory joining, squaring, sawing, mortising, um, for notice, the hoist up of beams, the push of them in their places, lying them regular. In other words, America is in many ways in Whitman's day being literally built. He's literally watching it happen and he's wanting to celebrate it. Setting the studs by their tenons in the mortises according as they were prepared. Everything is about order. Everything is about intentionality. This all becomes symbolic if you want it to be. The blows of mallets and hammers, the attitudes of the men, their curved limbs. We've seen that before in ideas of curved limbs, studying the body positions, bending, standing, astride the beams, diving in pens, holding on by posts and braces. Know all of these, I, notice all these ING words to give a sense of energy of action. The hooked arm over the plate, the other arm wielding the ax. And so you'll notice here that we're playing the game of the tool of the ax. Later we'll get to it as a weapon. The floormen focusing the planks close to be nailed, their postures bringing their weapons downward on the bearers, even though, notice we're back to the very first word of this, of this poem, weapon. We're back, even though we're tying it as a, as a weapon, we're actually talking about it as a tool, aren't we? 
The echoes resounding through the vacant building. Whitman loves the word echoes. I think T.S. Eliot learned to love this word echoes, and therefore in Bert Norton, my words echo thus in your mind. The huge storehouse carried up in the city, well underway. The six framing men, two in the middle, two at each end, carefully bearing on their shoulders a heavy stick for a crossbeam. I like the word carefully here. In other words, not only is America building, but the idea is suggested that it's being done in some kind of intentional, careful way. The crowded line of masons with trowels in their right hands rapidly laying the long side wall 200 feet from front to rear just to try to give a sense of the, ma the majestic building that is going on in America. The flexible rise and fall of backs, the continual click of trowels striking the bricks. Notice they're all working together, in other words. The bricks, one after another, each laid so workmanlike in its place and set with a knock of the trowel handle. I had a student who uh, came back to me and said, you know, I read all these lines in Passage 3 of Broadax, uh, and then this summer I worked with my uh, grandpa, and we did a, we did a, um, a project that required uh, brick laying, and I never realized just, A, how hard it is, and what an art form it is watching my grandpa do it. He said I was just blown away, and it took me back to these lines. And Right, Whitman is obviously celebrating art, right? The piles of materials, the mortar on the mortar boards, and the steady replenishing of the hoodman, spar markers in the spar yard, the swarming row of well-grown apprentices, strong, masculine, we're back to that idea. The swing of their axes on the square-hued log, shaping it toward the shape of a mass. So now all of a sudden we're, carpent we're, we're carpentering a another kind of thing. Obviously in Whitman's day, you would go out into the harbor, you'd see all these ships there, all, all made by wood, right? The brisk, short crackle of the steel driven slantingly into the pine. Again, he's just got this ability to elicit all kinds of sensual language. Again, show, don't tell. The butter-colored chips flying off in great flakes and slivers. It's, again, it's brilliant the way he's able to play the game of word picturing. The limber motion of brawny young arms and hips in easy costumes. I told you about this thing of him and hips from uh, Song of Myself 5 and elsewhere. Costumes, go back to the opening lines of Brooklyn Ferry to see his use of that word. The constructor of wharves, bridges, piers, bulkheads, floats, stays against the sea. Notice there's six there. And then all of a sudden he jumps to the very next image, and here we're going to get the image that is very familiar. If you're building everything with wood, you're going to have potentially lots and lots of fire. We think of Pepys, right, and in his diary regarding the Great London Fire. Here we're going to be playing a similar game. The city firemen, the fire that suddenly bursts forth in the closed packed square. Now you'll remember this thing about firemen. We've seen it in Song of Myself, Passage 33 with the masked firemen. In Song of Joys, the firemen's joys, and here we go. The arriving engines, the horse shouts, the nimble stepping and daring. We're back to that, that word daring again. The, the beauty of all adventurous and daring persons, right? The strong command through the fire trumpets, the falling in line, the rise and fall of the arms forcing the water. The idea that everybody's got to work together, but there has to be a leader, there has to be an organizer. The slender, listen to all the S sounds here. The splendor, spasmodic, blue-white jets, the bringing to bear, notice the building with the words, uh, with the uh, sound B. The bringing to bear of the hooks and ladders and their execution, the crashed and cutaway of connecting woodwork or through floors if the fire smolders under them. The crowd with their lit faces watching the glare and dense shadows, the forger, at his forage furnace. Now we're going to move away from fire making, from fire stopping to now fire making. The forger in his forge furnace and the user of iron after him. Obviously, iron and axes come to mind. The maker of the axe, large and small, the welder and temperer, the chooser, breathing his breath on the cold steel and trying the edge with his thumb. Again, notice all of the interesting special language that Whitman uses as if you're supposed to know exactly what that's all about when he uses these different words. The one who clean shapes the handle and sets it firmly in the socket. This, this idea of, uh, of the power of building something together. It takes so many different parts. The shadowy processions of the portraits of the past users also. Now here we go, the poet who is going to capture something of the past. The primal patient mechanics, the architects and engineers. Now we're going all the way back to the very beginning. The far off Assyrian edifice and the Mizra edifice, the, the biblical reference to Egypt. The Roman lictors preceding the councils. Um, uh, Norton's will uh, remind us that the lictors here are the minor Roman officials who carried the facies, the, road, the rods and axe, symbol of authority in procession. Preceding the councils, the antique European warrior with his axe in combat. We have to think about the way the, act, the word axe gets used in the Iliad. Think about Iliad 13, hard as the axe. In uh, the Odyssey 21, axe heads obviously are being shot through by Odysseus. In Aeneid 12, 
um, Alia swinging um, the, back his axe, um, and now we're playing the game. The uplifted arm, the clatter of blows on the helmeted head, the death howl, the limpsy tumbling body, the rush of friend and foe thither. Now, obviously, we're talking about the horrific use of axes in battle. The siege of revolted lieges, obviously, we're thinking here about Troy with siege, determined for liberty, the summons to surrender, the battering at castle gates, have to think about Arthurian motifs as well as Song of Roland, the truce and parley, the sack of an old city in its time, we cannot help but think of Priam in the loss of Troy, the bursting in of mercenaries and bigots tumultuously and disorderly, notice earlier it was orderly, we were building walls with brick, now it's disorderly, roar, flames, blood, drunkenness, madness, and now taking us back to Euripides and the Trojan women, as well as obviously Aeneid too, goods, Freely rifled from houses and temples, screams of women in the grip of brigands. It's a horrific image. Craft and thievery of camp followers, men running, old persons despairing. The hell of war. You'll remember that it was Tecumseh Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman, the great Civil War general, who said war is hell. The hell of war, the cruelties of creeds, creeds and schools in abeyance was his line from Song of Myself 1. The list of all executive deeds and words, just or unjust, the power of personality, just or unjust. How, do we get, how are we going to work now at, two, at, at level 2A with a set of lines like this? Notice it all comes down to that last phrase, just or unjust, making us obviously think of Plato's Republic. That is to say life has blessings and curses. This will be a huge part of Whitman's uh, theodicy. The axe is the weapon as well as the tool. It represents or symbolizes both. And to be all the allusions to classical texts that are happening here all the way through this section. At 3A, obviously the classics uh, as we've talked about. But I want to pause for a moment and remind us of what we've said elsewhere at LearnStrong.net. Crane's Red Badge of Courage. And the attempt to try to somehow capture, I mean, so many, so many um, uh, different titles that we've talked about with Crane. That ability to try to capture the chaos, the insanity of war. Obviously, Aeneid too comes to mind as well. Finally, at 3B, what was your favorite image in this catalog? Um, and what are your thoughts about these catalogs? Do you like them? Do you hate them? And why? And then finally, what is your view of the war, the hell of war and that war is hell? And, and the ways in which is it ever necessary that we would have to engage to resolve conflict through war? We'll move on now to passage four, and we are into the middle now with Song of the Broadaxe. Thank you.